Uh, now, so our speaker tonight is um, Dr. Gary Morrison. Obviously, um, Gary works with the um, Department of Classics here at the University of Canterbury. He's a specialist in Roman social history, uh, and he's better known within the department for some of his evening talks on the, uh, the nighttime antics of the Romans. Um, he's currently our reigning YouTube star with his films uh, on that film, you know. <laughs> um, but we're moving to a slightly more serious uh, <laughs> topic tonight, no, just a different topic tonight. Um, uh, looking into his research into uh, one of um, our wonderful classics teachers uh, who built up the department over, over many years and his influence um, not only on his students but also on the wider community. So would you join with me please in welcoming Gary to the stage. Thanks, Jerry. Okay. Well, welcome, uh, just to echo uh, Jerry, welcome again to the, the final of this series of talks on, on members of the Classics Department here at the University of, of uh, Canterbury. What I want to do tonight is introduce you all to Professor Hugh Stewart, or for some of you prefer, Colonel Hugh Stewart. Uh, for those that have been to some of my previous World War I talks, and I have given a couple that are connected to this particular topic. You'll know a little bit about Professor Stewart. He's an important reference in my research into classical allusions into the New Zealand, in the New Zealand World War I narrative. These are themes that I'll introduce again today as I, as I try to give you more of a picture of who Stewart was. So my focus is more on who Stewart the man this time rather than uh, the thematic themes that, that uh, I'll be looking at. Come through. Make your way through to the back. So um, we're going to have, we'll get more of an idea uh, as we work our way through uh, of into, into Hugh Stewart. And as I've learned more about him, I've become more inspired by his strength of character and his achievements. He led by example during World War I, as we shall see, he was undoubtedly a talented and driven individual, yet he was also compassionate and thoughtful. I think, it's all, I think it is fair to say that Hugh Stewart lived a rewarding life, albeit one that was beset with loss and personal tragedy. And tonight, I want to present glimpses of that life to you. So let's start at the beginning. Hugh Stewart was born in Scotland, as you can see from the slide behind me, on the 1st of September, 1884. He was the eldest of seven children, four boys and three girls. At school, he must have excelled as he won a scholarship first to the University of Edinburgh, and then, after a year, he was awarded a scholarship to Trinity College, Cambridge. Stuart completed his first-class honours degree in 1907, and then spent two years in Russia as an English tutor. He was clearly skilled in languages. He learned Russian during this time, and he wrote a book, Provincial Russia, which I must confess I have not yet read, but it's important, it, uh, it is reportedly on his experiences at this time uh, in Russia. In 1909, Stuart was back in the UK. He'd taken up a position as assistant lecturer in classics at the University of Liverpool. I like to think of this as a stepping stone to greater things, as it is from Liverpool that he moves to Christchurch, New Zealand. <laughs> taking up a position as the Professor of Latin at the then Canterbury College. That said, I must also acknowledge that Liverpool, or at least some of the people in Liverpool, clearly held an affection for him. He wrote letters and visited uh, people in Liverpool while on leave from the front during World War I. At any rate, in 1912, Hugh Stewart is walking the halls and the courtyards of the art centre. He is described, and I quote, as a brilliant teacher. He had the ability to inspire students and no doubt colleagues with his love of classics and literature um, beyond um, just, just classics. He was widely read, that comes through in, in all of the material that I've looked at uh, with regards to, to Hugh Stewart. I think he really felt at home here. The academic environment was rewarding and he was drawn to the Southern Alps, where, where he would spend time tramping and climbing the peaks. While he was Scottish born, he embraced this land and was undoubtedly also a proud Kiwi. In 1914, at the outbreak of World War I, Hugh Stewart enlisted in the Canterbury Battalion, New Zealand Infantry Brigade, as a subaltern, junior officer. 
the commission probably due to his known personality and temperament, as well as the fact that he had served as a territorial officer in the Liverpool Rifles. As was to become evident in the war, it was a well-deserved commission. He departed New Zealand as part of the first contingent, sailing on the Tahiti to Egypt. It is at this point that his life and my research converge. His war diary is in the Alexander Turnbull Library, Wellington, and in it are several classical allusions, some of which I've introduced in other talks, and some that I will come back to shortly as I try to build up an image of this man as I've seen him through his own writings. For now, we can observe that he was a formidable soldier and leader. He landed at Gallipoli in April 1915 and soon demonstrated his bravery and courage. In what modern scholars describe as a bitter hand-to-hand -hand, bitter hand-to-hand -hand fighting at Quinn's Post in June 1915, he was wounded in the head, but returned to combat, helping the New Zealanders hold the position. He led 15 men across no man's land under fire, leaping into the Turkish trenches. We could consider his actions courageous or foolhardy. Perhaps a little of both. <laughs> Nevertheless, in his diary, he simply describes it this way. Wounded in head, went to get it dressed, went up again, but rather sick. <laughs> this anecdote, I think, exemplifies his service, and it won the respect of those who served under him. The cultured university professor, known for his meticulous, meticulous planning and preparation, showed another side to his character. And he was rugged and a capable soldier. He is also often described as a natural leader, and one further anecdote, I think, sums up the care and consideration he had for the men under him. In short, while on Gallipoli, after some arduous fighting, as a messenger, uh, a messenger is sent from, battalion, uh, from the battalion CO to Stuart. Now, we don't learn the contents of the message. Presumably, it was a directive to undertake some further operation. But the messenger reports that Stuart's reply was simple. It's on the PowerPoint for you. Just tell the Colonel I'm damned if I'll disturb my men. They are just too tired. By the end of the war, his bravery had been recognised by the British and the French. A list of his awards for gallantry are on the PowerPoint slide. The military also recognised his, his, his abilities. By the end of the Gallipoli campaign, he had been promoted to Major, and shortly afterwards, in February 1916, he was promoted to Lieutenant Colonel and given command of the newly formed 2 Battalion. Stuart served as Battalion Commander on the Western Front for two years. Although without doubt, he was lucky to survive. On June 7th, 1917, at the scene, having meticulously planned his battalion's assault, the official record goes on to describe how he then pushed forward at great personal risk and under heavy artillery bombardment, uh, he personally led the forward companies. His planning and bravery led to success in this particular operation but when beginning to lay out his own battalion headquarters, he was hit by a shell, severely wounding him in eight places. Stuart was awarded the bar to his DSO for, this bravery, for the, his bravery on this particular occasion. And he was, he was at this time also when he was wounded in severe danger of losing his leg. Yet once again, his diary entry is interesting. He records the event in his diary as follows. One quarter back of a little trench. Graham through his hand, and ratty in foot, self and arm, uh, leg, knee, foot. And then he moves on. He does actually refer, uh, he does actually refer back briefly again a, a couple of days later. Uh, not a lot of detail. In November 1918, he was promoted to Kuhn, and he was put in charge of the education program set up to help soldiers transition back to public life. In February 1919, he was commissioned by the New Zealand government to write the history of the New Zealand Division. His account, the New Zealand Division 1916-19, a popular history based on official records, was published in 1921 and is, a, and is volume two of New Zealand's history of the Great War. Stuart returned to his adopted country and his position at Canterbury College at the end of 1919. The official biography information on Stuart's life is brief here, simply suggesting that there was a change of focus for Stuart, away from teaching to administration. This shift, it is suggested, was derailed at Canterbury College due to internal politics, and Stuart chose to look elsewhere for other opportunities. 
This is one of the holes in Stuart's life that I am yet to fully explore. I do not know what, if anything, happened at Canterbury College, College that may have caused Stuart to leave. I do know that he was caught up in one of those uniquely Christchurch political disputes over inscriptions on the, the Bridge of Remembrance. I will come back to what occurred, but I don't think that this in itself would have been enough to make him leave. He was engaged with and he did contribute to the college during this particular time. He wrote the words, for example, to the Canterbury College Latin School for the 50th anniversary of the college's foundation. He was also integral into he was also integrated, sorry, into the community, serving as the local RSA president and then serving as the national president of the RSA. So perhaps all we can say is that in 1926 it was time for a change. Whatever the reason, this was the year that Stuart departed New Zealand to take up uh, to be Professor of Latin at the University of Leeds. The desire to seek administrative duties is apparent here as he accepts additional roles and uh, is strong as a strong university and faculty leader in Leeds. Three years after returning to the UK, he was appointed Principal of University College Nottingham. Here he excelled and is commemorated at Nottingham today by Hugh Stewart Hall and a scholarship. Stewart maintained a deep connection with New Zealand. We know he returned to visit. He was here in 1934, where he spent time climbing in the Southern Alps, his last climb being up Mount Hutt in the middle of winter. He then headed back to England, but on the 21st of September, not long after his 50th birthday, Stuart unexpectedly died at sea. Now, in, prepara in preparing this overview of Stuart's life, there were several traits and events that struck me as informative in understanding a little more, bit more about the man himself. The first characteristic that I'd like to point out to you is his resilience and his drive to succeed. The obvious place to demonstrate this, well, these particular attributes uh, by considering what occurred in World War I, what Stuart witnessed, his actions, or well, the simple fact that he actually survived the war and the various campaigns in which he participated, such as Gallipoli. They're clearly indicators of his personal strength, perhaps a bit of luck. We'll come to Hugh Stewart in the war, but this focus tends to dominate views of Hugh Stewart. So to demonstrate his resilience and drive, I'd like to point out that his personal life was also beset with tragedy. He suffered personal loss during the war and after it. This can be most clearly seen by reflecting on his marriages. As we shall see, Stuart had three wives, two of them recently died. Hugh Stuart's first marriage took place on the 21st of February 1918 while in the UK. He married Alexandrina Johnston. Unfortunately, the marriage was tragically cut short. Alexandrina died on November 1920, 14 days after giving birth to a son, Michael. Again, another anecdote at this point of, of, of his life reveals much about Stuart's character. Having lost his wife, he sits down and writes a long letter to his newborn son, describing his, his former wife to him so that he could know his mother in case something happened to Stuart. Stuart's next wife actually reconnects him to Christchurch. His Margaret Poulton was from this city. They marry in July 1927 in England, but sadly she too dies, along with their newborn son and childbirth the following year. Fortunately, this narrative does end on a positive note. In 1930, Stuart marries Margaret Massey, again in London. She and their two children, Margaret and John, survived him. John is still alive and lives in London today. He actually learned about this talk online and got in touch. I do hope to meet him next year where I am planning to visit the, the UK. In terms of familial loss, I think we should also acknowledge that Stuart's three brothers served in the war and none of them returned. So while we can and must celebrate his last marriage and the joy he would have, would have come by being father to three children, Stuart also clearly suffered much. The point is that none of these losses and setbacks stopped him living. 
In the last part of this talk, I want to turn my attention to World War I and its aftermath for Stuart and Christchurch. As noted at the outset, my interest in Hugh Stuart is a result of my research into the ways that the ancient world has shaped the Anzac narrative, and so the way that we remember World War I. In this, Stuart's World War I diary has, proved, has provided some interesting anecdotes, which I have spoken about at length in other talks. So I will restrict myself here to one example, his reflection on the tragic losses suffered charging across the daisy patch. To be a little more specific, the date was the 14th of May, only three weeks after landing of what is now Anzac Cove. Stuart had found himself in the Anzac contingent that had been sent to Halifax at the southern end of the Gallipoli Peninsula. His diary entries at this point suggest that his mood is reflective, which when one considers the events that preceded his writing is perhaps not surprising. Stuart is penning his diary entry in the aftermath of repeated charges across the daisy patch, a field covered in spring daisies and a killing ground for well-fortified Turkish machine guns. Charging across this field cost the lives of many New Zealanders. In presenting this reflection, it is in presenting this reflection that Stuart engages with Homer, not through lengthy quotes, but rather through the simple comment that he could see the plain of Troy. Standing on the peninsula, this can't really be done. Troy is now away inland. We should not therefore take this statement literally, but rather as part of a reflective entry presenting a literary picture. While geography, the nearness of Troy, would have guided his choice of author, heroic idealism must have been far from his mind, replaced, I suspect, by scenes of human tragedy. In the Iliad, the plain of Troy is a scene of combat. Yes, it can be the, scene, the setting of heroic endeavour, but on many occasions, it's the place of tragedy and loss. I believe that Stuart is utilising that imagery to comment on what had transpired at the Daisy Patch, or to make the link explicit, for Stuart, the Daisy Patch was the new plain of Troy, a new scene of human suffering. Stuart's diary also affirms a passion for scholarship. He laments his lack of a homer while on Lemnos. But in Egypt and while in the Aegean, he did have a copy of Virgil and another of Horace. There are interesting connections between these works and imperial ideology, a connection evidenced in part by the writings of some war poets. Perhaps most famously, Wolfred Owen confronts us with the harsh realities of the war in Dulce et Decorum Est by using a line from Horace that appears to glorify heroic sacrifice. It is sweet and glorious to die for one's country, Horace writes. Dulcanet de Coronis for Patria Mori. Owens, of course, labels this particular belief a lie. The last few lines are on the powerful slide for you. My friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory. The old lie, Dulcanet. An interesting contrast with this particular attitude is that, of, that evident at the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst, where Horace's appeal was actually etched into the wall of their chapel. What Stuart would have thought, we cannot know. He was a man that understood duty and bravery. The role of empire was recognised and had meaning. Yet what he witnessed made him think. The allusion to the plain of Troy mentioned previously and other comments in his diary suggest as much. Now let us take this knowledge and return to post-war Christchurch, where the city had braced the idea of constructing a bridge to commemorate Canterbury soldiers who had participated in World War I, the city's bridge of remembrance. The bridge itself is of interest to me, as it too connects with antiquity, most obviously through its arch, which draws on triumphal arches of ancient Rome a point explicitly made in correspondence and reports at the time. That aside, Hugh Stewart appears also as a connection to this monument. As we noted earlier, in 1920, Stewart had returned, from a, returned to his role as Professor of Latin at Canterbury College in Christchurch. He also was a voice in wider New Zealand society as a reserve officer, the commander of the 3rd New Zealand Infantry, New Zealand Infantry Brigade, President of the Canterbury RSA and then President of the New Zealand RSA. 
In these two latter roles, he attended some meetings and, according to reports in newspapers at the time, expressed a view on the bridge's various inscriptions. More on that in a minute. But now I must point out that this role differs slightly from that that I've presented previously when I've actually suggested that Hugh Stewart was on the bridge committee. This does not appear to have been the case, but he was, as I have indicated, clearly involved, um, following too much of newspaper articles, which do get things wrong over mm -hmm. time. Uh, was where I went wrong there, but it's clear that he was, he actually attended meetings, as we shall see. He was participated in and he attended meetings uh, in the, um, of the, the bridge committee. Now let's go to the inscriptions. In late 1923 and early 1924, a typically Christchurch argument erupted over the English and Latin inscriptions to be placed on the bridge. Disagreement over the English one came first, with the bridge committee that had been set up to actually build the bridge, get the money and the finances to build the bridge. They put forward two particular options. The first, in memory of Canterbury sacrifice, 1914 to 19, and the second, erected by the citizens of Christchurch in grateful remembrance of Canterbury sacrifice, 1914 to 19. The Bridge Committee settled on the latter of these two, the slightly longer one, and forwarded it to the City Council. However, later that year, or early the following year, they were challenged by the City Council who presented and passed an alternative. And that, again, is presented to you on the slide. This memorial was erected by the citizens of Christchurch in grateful remembrance of those who took part in the Great War. Letters and accusations flew with the press. As part of the argument, the wording of the Latin inscription was also questioned, and the City Council decided that it too would put forward its own proposal of what the Latin inscription should be. And again, it's up on the slide for you. Remembrance of you should ever be cherished. The Council argued that its suggestion for the Latin inscription would be better than the Bridge Committee's proposal, which was what will a man not do for his country. At least that's the official translation. Non come back to that. The absurdity of the situation is perhaps best summed up by the title of an article in the New Zealand Truth on the 9th of February 1924, an article that sums up various parts of this particular issue. Uh, the title itself explains everything. It was quite simply, <laughs> Pontus and Norum, or in plain English, the Arsenal. So, what has this squabble got to do with Hugh Stewart? Well, as I indicated, his various roles in the community meant that he attended meetings to do with the inscriptions and he expressed his preferences. In short, he thought that the City Council's English inscription was, and I quote, vague and misleading. He approved of the first short inscription proposed by the Bridge Committee, suggesting that it was, and again I quote, the most suitable inscription that had been before him. He found the second inscription by the Bridge Committee acceptable, and he did endorse it, uh, but he clearly preferred the shorter one, um, but he was, he was fine with the second one. And what appears on the bridge today? Well, it's the second one of the Bridge Committee. So the Bridge Committee won over the Christchurch City Council, and again, um, Stuart did endorse this particular inscription. Now, there is far more available information about this debate when it concerns the actual English inscription rather than the Latin, although both debates were clearly intertwined. In the end, the Bridge Committee again wins out with regards to the Latin inscription, and it's the inscription that we see on the bridge today. From where they got this inscription, well, that's a little bit more difficult to try to ascertain, but it is also a bit more interesting. Although I have yet to find any evidence to prove it, I keep coming back to Hugh Stewart. He, at the very least, approved of this inscription, even if he didn't propose it. Consider how this was a man who had taken demonstra demonstrable and active interest in the inscriptions, whose um, whose actual opinion had been sought out because of his involvement with the RSA. He actually wrote a letter directly to the council on the inscriptions, putting, calling the council's inscriptions or proposals um, vague and uncertain and misleading. 
Um, he was too a decorated soldier and he was a professor of Latin. While I suspect any proposal on what the Latin inscription in particular could be, or even the endorsement of a pro proposed inscription, all would have been made through, officially at least, the RSA. So you won't, I won't find the direct, direct connection to what I'm saying, I suspect, back to Stuart. He would, have, he would have been there, he would have expressed his opinion, but it would have been done through the RSA. And um, I've yet to actually approach them to go back through their, uh, their records to see what I can find. Um, but his fingerprints, Stuart's fingerprints without doubt, must have been all, all over getting this particular feature of the bridge right. Latin was something that he was passionate about. He was involved there somewhere. I'm, I'm certain of it. The Latin inscription is also really interesting for, due to its apparent, apparent simplicity. Four short words that we cited earlier. Quid non pro patria. On an initial reading, there appears to be a connection to Horace. But abstract, but it's there. At least an echo in the sense of duty, perhaps, and responsibility on behalf of one's country, just through the words pro patria. The official translation reinforces that sense of obligation that comes through in Horace. What will a man not do for his country? The expectation is that one will do anything, even give the ultimate sacrifice for one's country. And that is to be remembered, and it is to be honoured. However, I believe that there is a bit more to these four words. The Latin is not as clear as it may at first appear. Moreover, it may be that the ambiguity is deliberate. At the time the inscription, was, um, the inscription itself was described as, and I quote, strong in its brevity. But let, let's begin with the Latin itself. A more literal translation is what is not done for one's fatherland or nation. The first change here is the removal of an individual, specifically a soldier giving everything, in the words of Horace, his life for his country. Someone reading the inscription may choose to see it in terms of what a soldier may sacrifice, but there are now also other options. The reference could now include abstract concepts, perhaps not questioning ideas such as duty and obligation in themselves, but obliquely commenting on the cost. Was there a limit to what should be paid and conversely expected. The second key difference is around the translation of patria. The official word choice of country is to be expected in modern, even early 20th century terminology. Yet, here again, there are other possibilities. Here, patria may be referring to the forms of imperialism, specifically New Zealand's link to Britain. Alternatively, it could be referring to Britain itself, obscuring any notion of a New Zealand identity. Again, the vagueness leaves interpretation to the reader. When we factor in these considerations, the translation can become more abstract and multifaceted, asking more than one question. I believe what we are presented with is an, inte is an intentional desire for a reader to question what occurred in the war, and perhaps to question the demands of imperialism. Did imperial obligation drive the sacrifice, and should that be acceptable? Well, one may be more nationalistic, but still question the extent of what is being asked for on behalf of one's country. There is a sense that the Latin could imply that the cost was too high, while still recognising and honouring the nationalistic or imperialistic sacrifice. Without doubt, there is deliberate ambiguity. If we are right, or if at least if I am right, you disagree with me, and Stuart was responsible in some way for the inscription, then I must stress that I am not suggesting that he was trying to lessen the sacrifice made by those who served. He clearly recognised and wanted to honour the feats of the New Zealanders. He was also clearly an individual who placed importance on attributes such as duty, respect and perseverance. However, there was a limit. A limit that we saw in his diary. I cannot help but remember the Stuart sitting at Hallows, reflecting on what had transpired at the Daisy Pack. That Stuart would have found a way for future generations to honour the past while asking new questions. He delivers that message through a medium that was also central to his life, a language of the classical world and the language of an empire central to the history of the European world, including the region's colonies. There may also 
for your personal anecdote deeply buried in the account as well. Although I must stress that I have no proof of this whatsoever. Um, apart from an understanding, perhaps, of a man that I have reached or again derived from the various readings that I've done. Earlier, I postulated an abstract connection between the Bridges inscription and Horace, which introduces the discussion that we also had earlier regarding Wilfred Owen's poetry. We know Hugh Stewart was well read. I emphasised that as well earlier in this talk. All the remembrances by his friends reinforce his love of literature. Was Hugh Stewart, after the war, aware of his poetry? We can't, of course, say for sure, but the classical illusions would push my answer into the following range. The twist is the subject matter of Duque et de Coribes, Owen's poem. The subject of it, for those that haven't read it, is the horrific death that's actually caused by a gas attack. Owen uses this to reinforce the heroic lie. The last eight lines of the poem, which I've given to you on the, um, the PowerPoint slide, give you the idea of what the poem is actually about. So if we read those, you can see how it ties into the four lines that I read out earlier. If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the cloth corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cup, of vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues, my friend, you would not tell with such high deaths the children armed for some desperate glory, the old life, to be it to for a part of So what is the connection to Stuart and so to the British? Well, Hugh Stuart's youngest brother died of a gas attack on the Western Front in 1916. Do we here have an opportunity for a nod to this loss, one symbolic of so many others? Again, I suspect we can never know. But it is an enticing question to contemplate. In closing, I must acknowledge that we can only ever know Hugh Stewart through his writings and those of others that wrote about him. He appears to be a determined, thoughtful individual, meticulous in his planning and driven to achieve objectives. His upbringing as the son of a Presbyterian minister and his actions in World War I suggest that he probably had a conservative political perspective However, that does not mean that he would not challenge authority and question traditional perspectives. His role as an academic demanded no less, and we saw him do this on the battlefields of World War I. Moreover, if I am right in my interpretation of sections of his diary and of the Latin inscription that is proudly displayed on the Bridge of Remembrance today, Stuart not only believed that the loss and tragedies of Gallipoli and the Western Front should never be repeated, he found a way through a language he clearly embraced both to honour those who, who did their duty and at the same time to question the path that led us there. And this, he left, he left a legacy and a gift for us all. Thank you. <laughs>